Sagen Sie jetzt mal bitte A. Ah. Ah, nein, Anarchie. 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 Ob geschichtlich oder brandaktuell. Mit Berichten und Interviews, mit Beiträgen und Collagen. Beleuchtet das anarchistische Radio Berlin das Phänomen des Anarchismus. Viva Anarchie! As Anarchist Radio Berlin, we had the opportunity of documenting a presentation organized by the magazine Silip in Berlin with the title Snitches for State and Capital. Therein, Kate Wilson talked about her relationship to Mark Kennedy and Evelyn Lubis about the spying of multinationals and the undercover research group. Unfortunately, due to technical problems, we could only record the first part of the presentation where Kate talks about her experiences. The presentation is held in English. Okay, so um, I'm, my name is Kate. I have uh, been, uh, I guess what people call an activist for a long time. I come from the UK. I was involved in... Um, Uh, first, an environmental direct action um, and in the mobilizations against the, the G8 summit and I've been involved in anti-capitalist and, and anarchist movements for a lot of years now. Um, and in 2003, I met a guy uh, who I knew as Mark Stone um, at one of the organizing meetings for the 2005, well, organizing meetings for the mobilizations against the 2005 G8 in the UK. Um, and to summarize a lot, uh, we, we met. He, he was a uh, very nice, very charismatic uh, guy. We uh, got together. We fell in love, we ended up living together for two years. Um, and in 2005, I left the UK and moved abroad, and that's uh, um, when we stopped living together, but we remained very, very close for a long time. Um, and the last time I saw him was in uh, August 2010, Uh, I went to the UK, we went out for dinner. He was one of the few people in the UK that I was still very closely in contact with. And uh, a couple of months later, I received a phone call from uh, friends, close friends in the UK, saying that they had proof that Mark was uh, had been a police officer who was infiltrating the political movements that we were involved in, and that... He, and that they wanted me to know before they published this information on the internet. Um, so that's why I'm here. <laughs> um, and um, obviously that, I mean, that phone call was absolutely devastating and that was five years ago and a lot of things have changed. We have a lot more information now and I'm going to talk a little bit about the last five years. If people want, have questions about, about anything else, I'm, I, I'm happy to answer questions, but I, sometimes it's difficult for me, so, so please. Um, so in, in the beginning, when, I first, when we first got the information about Mark obviously it was a very very personal thing like he was one of my closest friends we had been lovers um, and in the five years since then um, a lot more information has been found out about the the police officers and and now I don't actually think of that relationship as being a kind of personal um, betrayal or something that happened between me and me and Mark um, because and it took quite a long time to understand that to, that, that you know this wasn't something that happened between me and my friend like the man that I knew and the man that I lived with never existed um, he was uh, an invention that was created by the state he was backed up by 
state money, he had fake passports, fake driving license, <laughs> fake bank account. Um, and everywhere he went, he was followed by his handlers. Uh, he had um, his communications will have been monitored. My communications with him will have been monitored. Uh, there was a back room uh, at Scotland Yard. He was working for the London Metropolitan Police that were processing the data. He would speak to them pretty much every day. He would be going back there every two weeks to do debriefings and get psychological uh, support, supposedly, for, for the work that he was doing. Um, and there was a command structure that appears to have gone all the way up to the government that was basically making the decisions about whether I would have dinner with my boyfriend or not that night. Like, um, so, yeah, that, that's, that's quite a big change from the relationship that I thought that I was having at the time. Um, and it takes a really, really long time to get your head around that and, and start to understand. Um, the other thing that we now know um, about the, the policing in, in the UK. So when, when Mark was found out that he was a police officer, obviously um, because he was someone that we were so close to, it makes you start to look at other people who you would never think could be police officers and say, oh, maybe this person might also have been a police officer. Maybe this person might have been a police officer. And they now, um, in the UK, we now know that 13 people from the social movement, or probably more now. It was 13 last time I checked. <laughs> um, but More common. Yeah. Um, and of those 13 police officers over the last, like, 17 years, I've met six of them in different mobilizations and, and activist spaces. Um, and... <laughs> Um, I also um, in March of this year um, I, I now live in Spain um, and in March of this year I got stopped a couple of times by the, um, the Spanish police in slightly bizarre circumstances which eventually led to us having a look at my car and finding a, a GPS tracker stuck underneath the car um, and so I've basically over the last five years I've basically had to come to terms with this idea that I am what I think is called a person of interest to the police or surveillance community um, and so I've got quite interested in, in uh, surveillance issues and, and undercover policing stuff in general and um, it's it's becoming this really, like, since 2012 when the Snowden revelation started and then there was the undercover policing stuff in the UK and it's just got bigger and bigger and and, um, and one of the things that uh, I ask myself a lot, obviously, on a personal level, is why, you know, what, what, what did I do or what was I doing that, that like, made me such a... <coughs> Like what? What? What are not that exactly? No. What? What are the narratives that they create that that justifies this this like massive stuff that they are doing? And and one of the things that um, been looking at with the Snowden stuff is about mass surveillance. And there's lots of debating about that at the moment in Germany and in France and in the UK about like whether it's okay for them to do this mass surveillance and and this idea that if you um, don't have anything to hide, then you don't have anything to fear, and there's no reason to worry about mass surveillance. And as somebody who has now really quite a lot of unpleasant experience of targeted surveillance, um, I think that they're actually part of the same thing, because basically what they're doing is they're, they're, they build networks of who is friends with who and who knows who and like all of their surveillance whether it's mass surveillance or targeted surveillance is based on that it's on building these networks and um, 
And I read somewhere the other day that if you have 50 friends on Facebook, then at three degrees of separation from, from you on Facebook, you will have 1.5 million people on average that are your friends or your friends of your friends. Um, I don't actually have Facebook, but, um, but like that just gives an example of how, how that networking works. And three degrees of separation is what the NSA and GCHQ use as the distance that they build the networks, um, which actually means that the, the stuff that happened to me um, could be happening to anybody who is <coughs> close to the social movements. Um, and they... So what we now know about what they've been doing in the UK is that in 1968, I, I don't know if any of you have read the book undercover by um, Rob, Evans. Rob Evans and Paul Lewis. Lewis. Um, anyway, what, what they explain is that in 1968, when the Vietnam War was happening, the, um, there was a demonstration in London and, um, that went, went to the American embassy and it turned into a riot. And I've heard that the American soldiers were actually waiting behind the door um, with real bullets, and they were going to shoot people if the rioters actually got inside the embassy. Like, it was, it really got out of control. And um, after that, the police said, oh, my God, we can't, like, that, we can't get caught by surprise like that ever again. And some guy basically turned around and said, well, give me a budget and 10 police officers and I will make sure you never get caught by surprise like that ever again. Um, and they, he, they started this unit called the Special Demonstration Squad. And I don't know if I'm now talking about stuff. That you're talk no, about. no, no, go on. Um, they started this unit called the Special Demonstration Squad that, um, that Goes, has been inside all of the social movements, mostly on the left, but I think also on the extreme right in the UK, um, just being there. And they're not there to uh, actually catch people for crimes or they don't go to court and give evidence. They've just been for 50 years inside the social movements um, because they want to know who knows who, who, who is doing what, and, and they, they claim that, they're, that what they're doing is that they're trying to um, pick out the people who are likely to be violent. But actually, they themselves say that in order to be able to pick the people who are likely to be violent, they have to infiltrate everybody so that they can... So, so they're just there, and they, they talk about collateral intrusion, which is basically that... Um, everybody, so my parents, my grandmother, my entire extended family, Mark Kennedy came to uh, my grandmother's 90th birthday party and met everyone in my family that, who are not involved in political movements, they're not involved in um, any kind of campaigning. My mum's cousin is a cop, in fact, but all of those people... Were, were had their lives invaded by Mark Kennedy claiming to be my partner and, and coming to, to these family events. And, um, and yes, yeah, so that's kind of what happened. <laughs> um, and so in the last five years, what I have mostly been doing about it, apart from getting over the, the horrible, unpleasant... Uh, emotional impact of it is uh, I'm part of a group of eight women that is bringing a court case against the Metropolitan Police in London um, for a number of uh, different things that include uh, assault and uh, abuse of our human rights um, and that's been a really, really interesting process because, again, like a lot of the last five years has been about understanding that um, the stuff that happened between me and Mark was not personal. It was it was political, um, and talking with uh, other women who have been through the same experiences and the the women involved in my case. Uh, had relationships with different 
undercover police officers over a period of 30 years. So the first relationships happened in the early 1980s. Um, and through talking to them and, and, and sharing experiences, um, we basically come to understand that, that, that the stuff that seems very private and personal inside the relationships is actually um, something that these police officers are doing, have, been, have been doing systematically and I think are still doing. Um, and there, there are patterns that, that we've uh, identified as um, things that um, that we now think are part of how they are trained to emotionally manipulate people and psychologically manipulate people in order to to get into into your lives and I think um, I think it's important because before I knew that Mark was a police officer, having been involved in a lot of political stuff, um, sometimes people thought that they were infiltrators in the movement, like it, it wasn't a term that I'd never heard of, but people always seem to think that the infiltrators are the slightly weird person who has no friends and who makes you feel a little bit uncomfortable. and. Um, you're never quite sure why they're at the meeting or that you don't really understand. And actually, all of the police officers that have uh, been found out, to my knowledge, were very charismatic. They were very close friends with lots of people in the movement. And, and I think, actually, we were quite naive not to realise that they, they are psychologically trained to mirror people so when I met Mark, he was really into loads of the same things as me. And, and now when we look at it, after, after I separated from Mark, he got together with a friend of mine. And when we were together, he was really into uh, caravans and country music. And um, very shortly after separating, he got into drum and bass DJing and, uh, and a whole load of other things that, that were completely different. And... and were about getting into the life of, of somebody else. And, um, and also there was, um, like there are some examples that we have of really quite blatant emotional manipulation. So uh, Mark um, used to tell me about his childhood and how hard it was for him when his parents separated and about how his father abandoned him and his brother when they were kids. Um, I now know that his parents are still together. Um, and there are other examples of things like that. One of the women in, in the case, she, uh, her, the, the guy that she was with borrowed money from her to go to New Zealand to his mother's funeral. And he wrote her letters. Uh, from the funeral talking about how hard it had been and about how he gave a speech at his mother's funeral and actually his mother is still alive. Um, and these are very, very emotional things that make you feel close to somebody and they, you know, Mark used to cry when he told these stories and I guess he was crying about something else, you know, like... Um, and... Um, the other thing that, that Mark told me that I think is kind of revealing and, and maybe important is that um, at some point when, when we first met, he, um, I was at his house and he had very little possessions in his house and it was quite an impersonal space and, um, and I didn't know very much about his past at all. And, and I said to him, like, you know, we, we, were, we were there, I was spending the night, and I said to him, you know, actually, this is a bit weird, and, and I want you to tell me a little bit more about yourself because you could be a cop or you could be a serial killer or you could, like, like this, this place is, like, this, it has no personality. And, um, and he told me this story Again, very emotional, sharing his his secrets with me. That 
about how he had been involved with the mafia in London and uh, he had actually been a driver for the South London Mafia driving cocaine from Granada to, uh, in the south of Spain to London um, and that that was why he had money and that was um, uh, also why he kind of had no past and no possessions because basically he was running away and that there were maybe some quite nasty people who would want to find him. Um, and he asked me to help him keep his secret. Um, and that was a very difficult situation for me. Like, um, And we had an interesting... I, I gave this very uh, similar talk yesterday in Potsdam, and um, someone asked a very interesting question about that, which was about how the relationship that our political movement has with secrets um, actually makes it easier for these people to, to infiltrate because, um, you know, there are some places in the world where you go and tell someone that you're involved in international drug smuggling and they will call the police. Um, and we won't. We will keep that secret and actually people who have secrets are generally considered to be slightly cooler and, and more charismatic and um, so uh, yeah that actually and, and unfortunately I still find that story easier to believe than the real version uh, that he was in fact an undercover police officer he, he before he came to infiltrate us he was infiltrating um, the the uh, he was involved in, in drug infiltration stuff in London, and so he actually had, was quite convincing, the stuff that he said, and, and he always he, he kept up this persona of, of having been involved in that mafia stuff for the entire time that he was infiltrating him. Um, and... How are we doing for time? Okay. Um, and I, when I asked what people would want to talk about here, I actually usually don't give talks like this in, in kind of anarchist spaces. Usually um, I'm speaking to people who don't get infiltrated and, and, and kind of trying to let people know, like let people in the outside world know that this stuff is happening. Um, and... Uh, it's it's strange for me to be talking here, and I, I do occasionally talk in, in in activist spaces, and I always worry because it's quite a full-on disturbing story, and I really don't want to put people off or scare people away from doing political stuff, and I really want to say that all of the bad stuff that happened to me and whatever, I don't regret anything that, that I have done as an activist, and I wouldn't want to do any of it differently, and... Well, okay, some of it I would do differently. <laughs> um, but, but, yeah, really, like, I think I, think I, I don't want to scare people off. And, and one of the things it was suggested that we talk about today is, um, is like, what, what we can do and how, like, if we, now that we know this stuff, what we can do to... to, to catch the infiltrators in our groups and to, to, you know, keep going and deal with this reality. And I always feel when I'm asked that question that I am the last person that should be answering it because I obviously got it all really, really wrong. Um, and, uh, but I get asked it a lot. And so I kind of try to have something intelligent to say as an answer. Um, and one of the things that I think is really important is that um, when, when people, when Mark was found out, and actually because I was living abroad, I wasn't uh, involved in that, and I don't really want to talk too much about it because it, I think it was a very, very difficult experience and it's something that was lived by other people and I don't want to represent them. But um, what I will say from the outside is that I saw some of those people also when I was in... Uh, when I went 
back to the UK in August 2010 and I saw Mark. Um, and that was all going on at that time and none of them said anything to me about it. Um, and I knew absolutely nothing about the fact that Mark was maybe a cop until I was telephoned on the 21st of August 2010. And I think that is a really, really um, powerful thing that is really to the credit of the people of the research group that, that found Mark out because very often when this stuff happens, uh, people... There are whispering campaigns and people tell each other about it and there's kind of rumours and there's no proof. And, um, and actually the way that it was done was that they really kept everything like like normal, like not, didn't let anything, <coughs> didn't let anyone know what was going on until they were really, really sure. Um, and, and I think the reason for that is actually because um, it wasn't fun that Mark was a police officer. It wasn't um, something exciting like out of the movies, like, wow, we're, we're cool enough and hardcore enough as activists that they're infiltrating us. It was really, really fucking upsetting. Um, like, he was someone that we were all really, really close to. And, um, and so when people really started to suspect that he was a police officer, it was taken very, very seriously. Um, and I think that is really important. Like, if there's somebody in our movements that that people think maybe might be a police officer, then then take it really seriously and 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 keep it very quiet and try to find out and try to be sure. Um, because otherwise, what we get is uh, is people being kind of excluded because they're weird. Or, I mean, in Mark's case. Um, he, you know, he was a bit weird and a bit different from us. He was working class, he had a job, he didn't go to university, um, and those are not criteria that I think we should be using to exclude people from our movements. <laughs> um, like, I think it can be really dangerous. People say, well, what, you know, what are the things that, that you can say this person was, could be recognised as a police officer? He had a van. You know, like, again, not something we want to use as a, as a way of excluding people from our movement. So it's, it's very hard to, um, to, to do it that way, to say, oh, these are the things that you need to recognise in somebody to, to keep them out. And I think... I really believe that, that we need to be open about a lot of stuff that we do and we need people need to be able to come into the movements and we need to be inclusive um, and so I think yeah it's it has to be handled very very carefully um, and taken very seriously um, and the other thing that I think is really important um, about like of of my experience that that maybe isn't the the things that I think are most important to them to mention are the things that I just really hadn't expected so I really hadn't expected that the infiltrators that we kind of thought would be there would be the people that I really cared about and was really close to and and really trusted um, and the the other uh, the other thing which kind of comes from that is that once we knew that Mark was a cop, um, the emotional responses that I had to that, and I know I've talked to, to other people who are close to him that so many of us had to that, were not the responses that we would have expected. Like if you'd asked me six years ago how I would react if I found out that someone was infiltrating, like found out for sure that somebody in my political movements was an infiltrator, I probably would have given you a really politically correct, hardcore anarchist answer to that question. Um, and that is not how I felt at all. Um, and that is not what happened. Um, and actually the, the mix of emotions and, and for a very long time, like over a year, all I wanted was to see him again and for him to explain and, and the feeling was <coughs> like someone had died. 
you know, like someone that, that I really cared for had died and except I knew that he wasn't dead and, and I just wanted him back. Um, and I was convinced somewhere in the irrational part of my soul that, that, that it was all a big mistake and that he could just explain and it would all be fine. Um, and that took a really long time to sort out and a lot of this process of understanding that actually he never existed and that this was all a big state apparatus that was part of uh, a process of, of political policing and um, and and yeah it was very very important for me to be able to have all of those contradictory feelings and I think it's something that I want to say um, here because now uh, there have been these two police officers already uh, discovered in Hamburg and it's something that might happen here it, seem, it seems to be happening here in Germany and, and to really try to be caring with each other about the contradictory responses and feelings that people have because it you know like people's emotional reactions to it are not necessarily going to be the textbook politically correct <coughs> reactions that they should be having and we really need to look after each other in those times and and it sorts itself out over time you know? so. um, and then the the other thing is kind of what to do about it when you find out and I really don't have answers to that I mean actually I have been for the last four years um, involved in a court case against the police. I've been involved in giving evidence to Parliament about this. I'm now getting involved in a public inquiry that is happening run by the Home Office in the UK. These are all things that five years ago I would have said, if you find me doing that kind of politics, shoot me in the back of the head. Um, <laughs> and I really don't have... Uh, it's such a big thing and it's such a complicated thing. I, I don't believe in the justice system. I don't believe in parliamentary politics as a way of sorting stuff out. I'm not asking for them to change the law, but it's just trying to get the information about what was really going on and trying to actually do something politically that, um, that responded to the scale of, of what had happened. That's just kind of where I've ended up because I, as an anarchist I couldn't really find any useful response and if anyone has any really good ideas I would love to hear it. Um, and one of the few what I kind of think of as autonomous and, and not institutionally political responses that there has been to this stuff um, is what uh, Evelyn is going to be talking about which is the work of the undercover research group who have done a lot of the activist work in actually finding these cops out and getting the information out there. So, so yeah, I'm really interested to hear what you have to say. Because, <laughs> um, Thank you. So, yeah, I'm going to stop there.